My name is Peter, and I lead science and innovation at Carbon 180. We're a new breed of climate NGO that's focused on carbon removal. As you all know, mostly because I'm sure you've seen this graph 10 times today, emissions are still at an all-time high. We have a lot more work to do if we're going to avoid the worst cases of disaster. Climate change is no longer theoretical. We're experiencing this almost every day. Food shortages, wildfires, floods. The goal is to zero this out by 2050, but it's still sort of hard to imagine how we're going to accomplish that in just the short amount of period of time we have. And so it's going to really take the full extent of human ingenuity to be able to meet our climate goals. But there is a solution that's available in the many uh, solutions that do exist that I get to work on every single day, and that's carbon removal. Carbon removal is exactly what it sounds like. It's a set of technologies and practices that remove CO2 from the atmosphere and then store it durably in places like geologic storage, in wells, in biomass and other photosynthetic organisms, or in hybrid modalities like biochar or bio-oil, which then can be more durably sequestered. Actively removing carbon removal is one of the ways that we can buy more time to deal with some of the really hard to abate climate problems, things like flying and industrial processes, um, until we can really nail down the technology. But if we really want to be bold, we can also use carbon removal to deal with our historical emissions. So emissions that have existed for the last 100 years and are already causing issues on, on climate change. And so we have a chance to get to pre-industrial levels of society using the same technology. So despite how it sounds, this is not science fiction. Technologists and scientists have been working for decades to come up with really clever new ways to be able to accomplish this. They range from industrial machines for pulling CO2 out of streams of air to minerals that if you deploy them in agricultural soils, they can bind chemically to CO2 and then also improve yields to using uh, photosynthetic processes like planting trees and, and, and um, growing biomass. We know that these work. These have actually already been deployed across the world. The big question is, can we get them to enough scale so it makes a really big difference? By some estimates, we need to be able to build carbon removal industries 100,000 times what they are today, which is massive. We only have 40 years. But it's, it, by all estimates, it is possible today. And I'm sitting here with a group of people who is spending their Sunday sitting at MIT, MIT thinking about climate solutions or watching climate talks on, on the internet. So I imagine you're all not the kind of people who shy away from really hard problems. But let me stop for a second. Uh, since I am in a room with people who are fellow nerds, how many of you have actually seen a Saturn V rocket in person? Not as many as I would have thought. Um, so I can still vividly remember the first time I saw it just because it completely took my breath away. I just remember walking into Kennedy Space Station and not just marveling at its size, but also the complexity, like everything that it can do. It's hard to imagine today if trying to build something with all the constraints that must have existed back then, going from we choose to go to the moon all the way to riding this thing to another celestial body and dropping down on the surface all within seven years. It feels almost impossible, but they accomplished that. And a lot of it was done by setting extremely big goals. Um, and and, and it, I think the takeaway that I have from this is it demonstrates what humans are capable if we really put our mind to it. We choose to go to the moon. When Kennedy said these words, they had no idea how they were going to accomplish it, or most people had no idea how it was actually going to get accomplished. You can sort of imagine that after those words were stated, there were rooms of NASA engineers sitting there with their head in their hands, thinking, what is happening? How did he actually say this? But the US had launched its first person into orbit just a year before, and that orbit had lasted only 15 minutes. And so they had to figure out how to do, send a team of people to another planet, last for uh, eight days in just a few years, which was a 75,000% increase in the amount of time that they were supposed to live in space. That's an incredibly hard problem. I personally miss the first space race, but it's time to do it again. We're in a very difficult position when it comes to climate change, and we need to be able to funnel the exact same energy, resources, determination, and ingenuity to building gigaton scale carbon removal. Carbon removal is going to be the next space race, but this time hopefully not driven by two nations competing with each other, but motivated by the desire to actually build something across the globe that can actually prevent 
the biggest sources of societal harms and create a livable planet for everybody. I think that the parallels between the space race and carbon removal are pretty undeniable. So Kennedy made the declaration without actually knowing what was going on. The ambitious goals that were required were formidable at the time. I think NASA had some big questions about how they were going to get this done. And the answer was, we're going to invent new computing technologies. We're, we're going to commercialize photovoltaics, develop new medical abilities, and then build a entire army of engineers that could be deployed towards thinking about the next generation of aerospace and aeronautics. Carbon removal is in exactly the same place. We likely need between 5 and 10 gigatons, a billion tons per year to meet our IPCC goals. And today we're at less than 100 kilotons. And so this is going to be very difficult to accomplish and likely going to be one of the fastest ramps in history. And so how do you actually effectively ramp an industry given where currently technology is and knowing that you're actually not at the capabilities that are required. So yeah, NASA had a very similar question, I imagine. Um, and so for carbon removal, there are so much different infrastructure and supply chains that we're going to require to be able to do this. Things like energy that is both zero carbon, flexible, but also persistence. We need to understand how we move gigatons of materials like minerals around the globe. Um, and we need to think, be thinking about problems like how do we actually uh, build these in time with materials that don't have large carbon footprints. None of these are quite solved today. The way we do this is by getting an entire workforce involved. We're going to have to get all hands on deck for this. We're going to need to come together to make the impossible possible. And this is not going to be just engineers. We need designers and economists. We need people who are thinking about deployments. This is going to be a group of people who are coming to work with computers in hand, but also another group of people who wear hard hats and steel-toed boots. This is going to be a really a mobilization of our entire economy. One of the most iconic images of the Apollo missions was that image of the Earth over, just over the horizon of the moon. When you talk to astronauts about that moment, a lot of them are overcome with emotion. For them, they saw this Earth as this small, tiny object, and it was not clear to them why we have so much strife on our planet. Why can't we all work together towards common goals? And for carbon removal, this is another chance for us to actually accomplish that. It's not going to be possible for any one nation to wall off its atmosphere and remove carbon just for its citizens. Removing CO2 from the atmosphere is for everyone. It is all one unified spectrum. And so we have no choice but to work together. And any nation that decides to invest in this and actually deploy these solutions is going to be doing good for the entire planet. There's really no other way for them to do it. And then I think similar to space exploration and carbon removal, it isn't just climate that is beneficial here. There's a lot of other thing, reasons why we should be doing this. The first is economic. This could be the next big industry that exists. It's likely a trillion dollar industry and will employ a lot of the same folks who are now currently working in oil and gas. And so this could be a giant economic boon for this country and, and the world at large. It's also a big political opportunity. Carbon removal is one of the few pieces of climate action that is largely bipartisan. Everyone wants to see this happen and see this industry win. Environmentally, a, one great way that we can do carbon removal is by investing in, supporting, and reinvigorating our natural carbon stocks. So that's forests, that's mangroves, that's oceans. And so environmentally, we win by investing in carbon removal, and the forests in, our nat in nature win as well. And lastly, socially, a lot of the harms that have been created from, a lot of, from the emissions that have been done to date have been sitting on frontline communities. We've been deploying factories and power plants in their neighborhoods, and that's not fair. And so carbon removal helps partially to address some of those injustices by removing that CO2 and creating other types of benefits for those communities where these will be deployed that deal with historical injustices. This is also an exploding industry. So federal funding has increased more than 1,500% in just two years. Private investment is actually even more than that. And so this is really an industry that is ready to take off. And many of the smartest people in the world that I've met who have been entrepreneurs, have been technologists, who want to build something new are, are getting into this space. So what's our game plan for actually getting to the moon? There's a lot that we need to do over the next seven years, by 2030, to get us in a, in a really good place for carbon removal. First is on policy. This is going to be uh, a public good. 
So this is something that government will have to lead on, and we need to set the right frameworks for building new solutions, permitting them, building infrastructure like clean energy. And so governments and policy will be the way that we accomplish that and lead on it. Accountability. So we need to make sure that if we remove CO2, that it's being done correctly and effectively. That's going to require new technologies, new sensors. CO2 is an invisible, inert, highly diffuse gas in the atmosphere. It's around us right now, but we can't see it. And so we need to know that our interventions are actually being effective, and so we need to build new ways to accomplish that. Funding, this is going to require a lot of money, both for R&D and deployments. And so we need that from private sector and from government. And lastly, community engagement. We shouldn't make the same mistake where we're deploying industrial-sized facilities or new uh, projects in places where people don't want them. We need to engage with those types of stakeholders and make sure that communities are excited to see carbon removal being deployed uh, in their backyards. And so what we need most of all, though, is people. We need people who are really excited about building the next frontier of climate interventions, and that really is everybody. So if you have a background that it can be used in carbon removal, and it really is almost everyone, you should build with us. There's so much that we can accomplish. The timeline is short. These are going to be very hard problems, but really fulfilling. This is one of the few chances we have to actually create a livable world for future generations, similar to the kind that we've had. And so one thing that I said is there's a roughly 100,000% increase in the amount of scale that we need for carbon removal. That probably worried a lot of you. It is a lot. But if you think of space as an analog, the first person from the US that w went into space, as I said, 15 minutes. The longest someone actually has spent in space is 400 days. And so that is over 4 million percent increase in terms of time and space. And the technical complexities that are required to stay longer do scale with time. And so we've done this before. This is going to be incredibly hard, but it is within our capability. So hope you'll work with us on accomplishing that. Thank you.